Yeah, that works. Amazing. All right, without wasting uh, more time today, Aiden will introduce you to the ominous parameter Y plus. So what is Y plus? What does it actually mean? And we have actually two workshops with Aiden. So we'll first introduce Y plus and then in the next workshop, we'll work a little bit more um, through that. So without further ado, Aiden, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, um, Y plus is quite a, an ominous topic uh, in CFD. Those of you who have done some CFD before will see this, this phrase, this parameter always showing up. And those of you who haven't done CFD before will soon find that this parameter appears. So today's talk, I'm gonna introduce you to Y+, explain what it means, and more importantly, show what you can do with it and what you should be thinking of when you do your own CFD studies. So let's, let's, let's kick things off. Why should you care? Why should you care about this parameter Y plus? Well, to jump straight to the conclusion, Y plus is a parameter that affects the accuracy of CFD results. So what that means is, is if you run a CFD simulation of some type, you'll get a result. You may get some numbers out of it. You may get some contours, but the accuracy of those numbers depends on Y plus. And indeed, if your Y plus changes, your results may change. So what you should know as a CFD engineer, and what I hope I'll be showing you guys by the end of the talk is you should know what Y plus means. You should know what your Y plus is for your simulation. And you should also know why you chose your Y plus as well. And the reason that you should really know the answer to all of these questions is that reviewers of CFD analysis will often ask you what your Y plus is. So if you do a piece of CFD analysis and you write a report or a, a journal paper or a thesis and you submit that document, then the reviewers will often ask you what your Y plus is. So you should know what yours is and be prepared to defend your choice as well. And hopefully by the end of today, you should know and be able, be able to do that. So how I'm going to introduce this topic of Y plus is I'm first going to do a bit of background theory and then I'm going to answer the main questions of how you can change your Y plus so you know how to control it in your CFD simulations. You'll then, I'll then go through what Y plus you should be aiming for. So do you need a small value, a big value? What specific number should you be aiming for? And then I'm also going to talk about other meshing parameters as well, because without going into too much detail right away, Y plus is a parameter associated with the CFD mesh. So whenever you run a CFD simulation of a domain, whether that be an aerofoil or some internal flow simulation in a, in a tank or a ventilation system, for example, you're always going to have to generate a mesh. And there are many different ways you can mesh geometries and many different ways to assess how good a mesh is. And Y plus forms a part of this assessment. Y plus is a part of the assessment of the mesh that you're going to use for your CFD calculations. So let's start with the background theory. The first thing that you really need to know, and this is really important whenever you're carrying out CFD, is to remember that CFD codes assume that the variation of all the flow variables, so velocity, temperature, pressure, uh, turbulent kinetic energy, all of the parameters that you'll see a CFD code calculate vary linearly between cell centroids. So you can think of this as the CFD code calculates the value at the centroid of a cell, the value at the centroid of the next cell, and then between those two centroids, it's assuming that the variation is linear. So for example, if the CFD code calculated a temperature of 100 degrees C at the centroid of this cell and a temperature of 200 degrees C there, then the temperature halfway between those centroids would be 150. And linear is the best that CFD codes can do. And this is quite different to uh, other simulation types, which you may do. So finite element analysis, for example, can do higher order and do quadratics and things. And spectral element method can go even higher. But in CFD, everything is linear. That's always the way to think about it, is that everything is varying in space with linear functions. And that's going to have implications for us when we generate our mesh. Now, the next thing you need to think about is when uh, in fluid mechanics, 
Fluids often flow over walls and solid surfaces. And those solid surfaces can be physical walls. If you're in a, an internal flow domain, for example, uh, there'll be the physical walls of the pipes and the channels. Or if you have an external simulation, like the flow over an airfoil or a racing car, that wall is the solid surface of the object. And you'll remember from fluid mechanics that we have boundary layers that are developed very close to the wall. We have thin boundary layers developing over all of the wall surfaces, whatever you're simulating. And boundary layers are very thin. And what does a boundary layer actually mean? You may or may not remember this concept from fluid mechanics lessons. What, is, what does a boundary layer actually mean? Well, a boundary layer is actually just another way of understanding how the velocity and the temperature varies close to the wall. You remember that at the wall, the velocity is equal to zero because the flow can't move through the wall and it sticks to the wall, so it can't run along it. And then far away from the wall, it's at a free stream value. And so you end up with a profile of velocity, which may look something like this running along the wall. And the boundary layer refers to the very thin region, very close to the wall, where the velocity is much lower than the free stream velocity. And you can define it in a number of different ways, the boundary layer, but we don't really need to think about that. For our mesh and for our CFD calculations, we're thinking about the linear variation between centroids. So if we move along a line down these cells towards the wall, of course, the velocity here may be two meters per second. Here, it may be 1.9, 1.8, but very close to the wall, it's zero. And you can see that the velocity drops off very rapidly close to the wall. And what that means, of course, is that if we want our solution to be accurate, we have to use very thin cells because we can only do linear in CFD. We're not doing finite element analysis or spectral, spectral element method. We can only do linear. And that means to resolve the gradient, our CFD mesh has to be very fine close to the wall. And this is a problem for us because there are lots of walls in CFD domains. And if you're doing a racing car or an airplane, for example, that's a massive surface which you need to cover with very thin cells. And of course that increases the total number of cells in your mesh and makes your simulation slower to run. So what, what some people do is they may say, well, what if I just use a big cell next to the wall? What if I don't use one of those thin cells close to the wall? Well, what actually happens is, of course, you get a scenario that looks something like this. The real profile is, of course, following some power law. It may be logarithmic. And the CFD code can only follow this solid line. And you can see there's an error there. The CFD code is not capturing the profile correctly. And what does that mean? Why does this matter? Well, from fluid mechanics, you may remember that the wall shear stress is equal to minus the dynamic viscosity mu times the velocity gradient at the wall. And you can see that this gradient here is wrong. The gradient's wrong. The gradient's not steep enough. The CFD code is under predicting the gradient. And that means that the CFD code will predict the wall shear stress incorrectly. And by extension, the lift coefficient, the drag coefficient, all of the parameters that you want to calculate from your CFD code will be wrong if the cells are too big. So what can we do about this? We, we need to do something. There's one method we could use very thin cells. That's what we really should do. We really should use thin cells. But what if we can't? What if our simulation ends up with a billion cells? That's clearly too much and we don't have a computer big enough to solve it. So the idea, and this is what all modern CFD codes do, is they apply a correction if the cells are too large. So I want you to think about the layer of cells that's going to be following along an aerofoil surface all the way around the aerofoil or around your solid body. And that layer of cells, if it's small enough, if they're really small and you're getting that linear variation through the velocity profile, the CFD code doesn't apply correction. It's fine. But if your cell is too big, then the CFD code is going to do a correction. But Clearly what you can see here is that somehow we need to assess how big is too big. When is the cell small enough? And when is it too big? When does it need a correction? And this is where the idea of Y plus is going to be coming in. 
Now what we need to do is take a little a little divergence, a little move away from what we were just talking about with CFD meshes and think about fluid mechanics in reality, what really happens. Now, a number of experimental measurements were taken back in the 1970s and 1980s, where people measured what the velocity profile looks like in a pipe flow. So simple flow in a pipe where water or air is passing along a pipe and people put lots of measurements in and they measured how the velocity varies across the width of the pipe. And it turns out that when they go very, very close to the wall, the velocity profile follows a shape which looks something like this. And this is how you'll see the profile represented classically if you look on the internet. But of course, in reality, the axes are the other way around. Y is the direction normal to the wall and U is the velocity. That's why it looks a little bit funny there. But what did the measurements show? What did the measurements show? Well, the experimentalist looks at many different, many different sizes of pipe. They looked at very small pipes, very large pipes. They looked at pipes with different fluids in, with water, air, and with very sticky fluids as well. And they looked at different speeds as well. What if they really rushed the flow through the pipe? And what they found was that if they plotted this profile, rather than in traditional Cartesian units of X, Y, and Z, the distance in meters normal to the wall, if they plotted with a special unit called Y plus, then all of the profiles collapsed onto a single curve. And that was the really powerful thing about the experimental measurements is that regardless of how big the pipe was or how fast the fluid is flowing through it, the velocity profile normal to the wall showed the same universal shape and this is sometimes called the universal law of the wall. The velocity profile always took this form, but that's only when they express it in these wall units, U plus and Y plus. So hopefully now we can start to get an idea of what the CFD, uh, the CFD users and the people who write the CFD codes were trying to do. If you could work out how big that cell is that's right sitting right on the wall if you could work out how big that cell was in si in a size of y plus rather than an actual size of y meters in a size of y plus you know what the velocity should be at the center of that cell from experimental data and we can use this profile to correct the wall shear stress so that's the idea and this is why people you need to know what y plus is because the profile will be universal and you can correct it using experimental data. So we need to know how big our cells are. We need to know the size of our cell in wall units, so Y plus units. And you'll notice that these don't have a dimension. This isn't in meters. So Y here might be three millimeters, it might be five micrometers, but Y plus is only three. And for this much larger cell, Y plus is equal to 50. So we're getting an idea of how we can measure cells in these wall units in Y plus. And what we're gonna find, although I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail here today, is that the correction that the CFD code applies depends on Y plus. The CFD code will look at all of those cells that are on the surface of your body. And if Y plus is a small number, which I'll go through later, it will say that cell is small enough, I'm not gonna apply correction. But if Y plus is a lot bigger, then the CFD code will say, right, I need to apply correction. And the correction I apply will be based on that universal profile that was taken from experimental measurements. So the next thing I want to talk about is how is this, this quantity Y plus actually defined? What is it and how do you calculate it? Well, there's actually a very simple formula for Y plus, which actually looks fairly similar to the Reynolds number formula. And if you look, it's just a simple fraction. Y plus is equal to the density multiplied by this new thing called a friction velocity multiplied by a distance, YP, and divided by dynamic viscosity. So what, what does this actually mean? What does this formula actually mean? What is Y plus? Well, if you think about your cell, so you have your cell which is next to the wall, this is the cell that's stuck on the wall. YP is just the distance of the centroid from the wall. So you can think of that, that's the physical size of the cell in real units. 
This might be in millimeters or it might be in meters. And then we've got the density. So how dense is the fluid in the, in the cell? What's its dynamic viscosity? And you tout this is the friction velocity. What does this mean? What does this mean? Well, it turns out that the friction velocity is a special quantity, which is actually calculated internally by the CFD code. This isn't something that we can easily calculate manually. And this leads us to a very, very important point is that Y plus is actually an output from the CFD code and not an input. And that's a really important uh, misconception that people often have. So what's this telling us? This is telling us that the CFD code, what it will do is it will calculate this quantity U tau for all of the cells that are on all of the surfaces of all of the walls in your mesh. It will multiply that quantity by the density, the dynamic viscosity, and the physical size of the cell. And that will give us the size of the cell in dimensionless units. So it's size in dimensionless units. And that will be given back to us as an output from the CFD calculation. So because Y plus is an output and not an input, that means you can actually plot it. So if you set up and ran a CFD calculation of any type, you run the CFD calculation, you get into the post-processor, and the same way that you'd look at the temperature and the velocity, how fast the fluid is moving and the forces, you could also plot Y plus. So it's an actual quantity that you can look at and you can plot. And here's an example of a surface. And what you can see is that there's a value of Y plus for all of these cells on the surface of that body. And for this, they're in the range of zero to 100. So for you, what that means is actually you don't even really need to know how the CFD code calculates Y plus. What you need to do is you run an initial CFD calculation and then you look at your value of Y plus. You can treat it like a black box. Just run a calculation and then look, what number do I have? Have I got 30? Have I got 500? Have I got 1,000? And what this means is, is that we actually have a way of changing the value of Y plus without knowing any of the detail of what the CFD code is actually doing. What you can do is you can look, run your initial calculation, look at what the CFD code produces. And for example, here, maybe my Y plus is around about 100 over here because my physical cell size is one millimeter. And let's say I wanted to reduce Y plus. Well, if I wanted to get my Y plus down from 100 down to about 50, then I probably need to half the size of my cell. Because if you remember back from this previous formula, we've got the fluid density and its dynamic viscosity, and those quantities aren't really going to change close to the wall. So if I want to change Y plus, I can just reduce the size of my cell. So here's the example. I just, I've run my initial calculation with a cell size of one millimeter, and I've got my Y plus. I'll just squish the cell, I'll reduce its size and run again. And now look, my Y plus is down at around about 50. So this is quite a labor intensive process because it does mean that to change your Y plus, you're going to have to create a new mesh. Every time you want to fix your Y plus, you have to create a new mesh. So this means running multiple simulations in order for you to get an accurate result. And how do you actually change the size of your cell? How do you actually change the size of that cell that's right next to the wall? Well, this will really depend on what your meshing software is. If you're using a block structured meshing software, if you're using something like ISOM CFD, you'll need to go and change the edge parameters on the edge of the blocks. And you'll need to change it so that that initial uh, increment on the blocking side is smaller. And likewise, if you're using an unstructured mesh generator, then actually you'll need to go in and change the parameters of the layers and actually change the thickness of that first cell that's on the wall. So this is the process. This is how you change your Y plus and you just keep changing the size of the wall adjacent cell. And what you do is each time you run the CFD simulation and you look at the value of Y plus and you keep changing the cell size until you get the values that you want. So this is the thought process. Y plus is an output from the CFD simulation and you change the cell sizes until you get the Y plus that you want. But of course, this leads us to uh, a very 
some very straightforward and some straightforward questions. The first one being, well, what value of Y plus do I even want? What should I be aiming for? I mean, I can clearly change it by changing the cell size. What value should I be aiming for? And also, what am I going to use as my initial guess? Because Y plus is an output from the CFD simulation, I'm going to have to generate a mesh of some kind to then use to run in the CFD simulation. What should my initial guess be? Well, there are a number of ways that you can estimate and make an initial guess for your first mesh. And we're actually going to do a bit of that in the workshop, which will be the next talk. But what you can do is you can actually use an empirical correlation to estimate this fancy quantity U tau that's calculated internally by the CFD code. And this is just one example of an empirical correlation that you can use where what you can do is say, I'm going to assume that the wall of my CFD domain is a flat plate. And you may remember from fluid mechanics that uh, a boundary layer can develop on a flat plate and there are actually empirical correlations for how the boundary layer develops and the shape of the velocity profile. And there are also correlations for the wall shear stress. And we can use one of those. And the definition of U tau is that it's actually the square root of the wall shear stress divided by the density. And so we can estimate the wall shear stress using the definition, and we can estimate the skin friction coefficient using an empirical correlation here. So this is how you might uh, estimate your first mesh. You can use this correlation to calculate the skin friction coefficient, use that to calculate the wall shear stress, use that to calculate U tau, and then you can use the formula that we introduced earlier to estimate what the size of that initial cell is gonna be for your first guess. And we're gonna do a bit of that in the workshop, so don't worry if that seems uh, a bit confusing for now. So that's the answer to the first question. How do you pick your first mesh? You can use an empirical correlation or you can do it based on experience of doing similar, similar calculations. But we need to now answer the second question, which is what Y plus should you even be aiming for? What's the target Y plus? And the first thing that makes this question quite difficult, and if you've ever tried this before, you'll notice that, well, Y plus varies over the surface. So if you have an aerofoil, typically your Y plus may look something like this. Near the leading edge, Y plus is a bit higher. For here, it's about eight or nine, and it varies, and then over the trailing edge of the aerofoil, Y plus is more constant and then it tails off towards the back end. So what value of Y plus should you even use? Because you're going to get a value over all of the surfaces in the domain. And actually the key is to use the value of Y plus in the area that's likely to affect your results. And this is where a bit of engineering judgment comes in and a bit of practice. So if you're doing an aerofoil simulation, for example, you know that one of the most important regions of the aerofoil, particularly at higher angles of attack, is going to be the trailing edge, because that's where you're likely to get flow separation. And so actually, the value of Y plus that you're calculating over that trailing edge is the important part of your domain. And so in this case, my Y plus is actually probably about three or four, and I might be targeting a Y plus of one or two. And so I would use this value that I'm calculating here. And that would be the focus of my calculation. Next slide. So let's go on to what Y plus should I actually be aiming for? I've showed you how to estimate it, how to iterate through and change it by changing the size of that cell. But what's the target value? What target value of Y plus should you have? Well, the first thing to notice is to go back to what we spoke about earlier with the experimental measurements. And this uh, velocity profile, this universal velocity profile that the corrections that the CFD code uses is based on empirical data for a fully developed pipe flow. And so what that means is that for large values of Y plus, so when we have big cells and Y plus is very big, the corrections that the CFD code are going to use are going to be based on this profile, which come from data for a pipe flow. And those corrections are going to be only going to be activated up here. But when Y plus is around about one, when Y plus is very low, remember the cell is very thin, 
it turns out the CFD code doesn't apply any corrections at all. So what that's telling us is that we're only going to want to use uh, large cells, so big cells that are going to need a correction with large Y plus if the flow is somewhat similar to a flow in a pipe flow that's fully developed because that's where the correlations were developed. But if we've actually got a new flow, a complicated flow, something with heat transfer, flow separation, then that type of flow in reality is not well represented by a pipe flow. So we're actually going to have to go ahead and use those really thin skinny cells. And that means using Y plus of around about one. So you're going to actually have to use a bit of engineering judgment here and look at the simulation that you're trying to create. What are you looking at specifically? And then think how well represented is that flow by a fully developed pipe flow. And definitely for complex flows where, you, where accuracy is really important. So separation off the back of a trailing edge of an aerofoil or an impinging jet flow, natural convection, complicated flows like this are clearly not well represented by a fully developed pipe flow. So for these, we aim for a Y plus of one, and that means we're aiming for those really thin cells. So the CFD code is not going to correct the wall shear stress. But actually, if accuracy is not essential, then we can have a larger Y plus, bigger cells, and we let the CFD code correct the wall shear stress, which is probably reasonably accurate. And the generally uh, accepted range of Y plus values is in the range of 30 to 200. So if you think about your own CFD domain, if you've actually got any ducts or pipe work in there, or if you've got flow over a flat wall where nothing much is happening, or if you're just doing a test case and you're testing some new functionality out in your CFD code and you don't really care about accuracy, then it's fine to aim for Y plus in the range of 30 to 200. And you can start to see through, through the talk as we've been going here, why it's really important for you to choose a Y plus to aim for, to then try and achieve it. And then ultimately in your report, in your thesis, you'll have to justify why you chose that value of Y plus. So you may say in your document or report that actually I'm looking at flow separation, high angles of attack from a wing or aerofoil or blade. And for that reason, the corrections are likely to be inaccurate. And that's why I chose a Y plus of one. And then you can always show that you've achieved a Y plus of one through contours. But of course, the other uh, takes, uh, the other is valid as well. If you have flow through a piping system, for example, long stretches of uh, flat pipes that aren't, aren't doing anything special, then you can quite reasonably claim actually, I don't need a Y plus of one because this is very close to a pipe flow. And so the corrections are likely to be accurate. Um, I'll go back to that slide in a minute. But how do you really know? Because this is all a bit, this is all a bit hand wavy. You're using engineering judgment. But how can you prove that your chosen value of Y plus is correct? Because this is quite a common, uh, a common rebuttal from a reviewer is they may say, I can see you've chosen a Y plus value of 50, for example, but how do I know that that's accurate? You've just told me it is, I need proof. And ultimately, of course, if you can show proof, then your paper or thesis or manuscript is more likely to be accepted by the reviewers. And this is just a little extract of some work that I actually did in my thesis and is a great example of how you can justify your choice of Y plus. And what I did is I had uh, a number of aerofoil sections like this. And what I did for the aerofoil section is I created my mesh, I ran the CFD simulation, I looked at the Y plus value, I went back to the mesh, refined the cells, and I ended up with two different meshes. My first mesh was a very, a very fine mesh with very thin cells, it had a very high cell count, and it took a long time to run the simulations. And then my second mesh had much coarser cells, with a Y plus value of 30. And what I did was I took both of those meshes and ran the same simulations. And what you can clearly see from this image is that for the particular scenario that I was looking at, actually at low angles of attack, the aerofoil was really well predicted with both meshes. 
and that actually it didn't matter if I had a Y plus of 30 or a Y plus of five because I was getting the same lift coefficient. And that's a really good way that you can say to the reviewer or the examiner, uh, my simulation, I was only looking at angles of attack of around five degrees and clearly both meshes are producing almost identical results. Therefore, I'm justified in my choice of Y plus. But if you look up here at the right end of the graph at high angles of attack, when the flow starts to separate off the back of the aerofoil, you can see that actually the meshes do start to produce different results. And that, of course, is because when the flow starts to separate, the nature of the flow in a recirculation region is very different to what you have in a fully developed attached pipe flow. And so the larger mesh Y plus of 30 with the corrections from the CFD code actually starts to produce a worse result. So if I was up here and I was looking at high angles of attack, then I would have to use that finer mesh. And hopefully that gives you some idea of how you might look at your own simulations and how you can really prove to your reviewers and examiners which value of Y plus you chose and what effect it has. Because this is really a perfect defense. There's nothing a reviewer can do to disregard the analysis that you've done if you do something like this. And what I want to do before just wrapping up this talk is just talk about a few other parameters because of course Y plus is not the only um, is not the only metric for a mesh that affects how good your mesh is. And this is actually something that often uh, reviewers and uh, examiners of CFD simulations often get wrong. You can see this is a common error trap that people think that if you have a Y plus of one, you've got really thin cells. And so your CFD simulation must be good and it must be accurate. Well, of course, that's not true. Y plus is part of an entire assessment of how good a CFD mesh is. And some other parameters, which of course will affect the accuracy. The first one being mesh quality, that's fairly obvious. If you have some really skewed or distorted cells in your mesh, that's going to affect the accuracy in that area of the solution. And also parameters like the growth ratio of your layers. And this is something we're gonna look at a bit more in the workshop as well. If you're using an unstructured mesh generator and you grow layers away from the wall, then actually, if you have a growth ratio that's uh, too, too low and the transition between cells uh, at the end of the mesh is too steep, then you can end up with a loss of accuracy there where you've got a large volume transition. And so I've, I've just made a note here, of course, that when people are reviewing your uh, CFD analyses, it's quite rare for people to inquire about these quantities, but they are also important for solution accuracy. So you should be aware of what you have for your mesh. And this is just an example of how the volume transition and the layers can also affect the results as well. If you think back to right at the start of this uh, lecture, we talked about the velocity profile that's normal to the wall with the boundary layer. And in this case, I've only got three layers, three thin cells. So this cell here might have a really low value of Y plus. This might be a very small cell really good accuracy, no correction from the CFD code. But of course, one, two, three cells up, I'm using a linear profile. But now here, there's a large jump between cells, between this centroid and that centroid. So you can see there's an error in the profile. This is why other parameters in the mesh are also important as well as Y plus. But luckily, the volume transition, you can usually check that visually. And that's something we're gonna look at in the workshop as well. You can see here that actually these triangles are much larger than those layers. And so we might actually want to use a bigger layer on the top. So I've talked about quite a lot today. Hopefully it has sunk in and that you've understood it. Um, just to summarize what I've talked about, the reason that Y plus is important is because it affects the accuracy of results. And so if you have a Y plus value that's really large or is you just haven't thought about it at all, you can still get a CFD solution, but the solution itself might not be that accurate. And it's often requested by reviewers. So make sure you know what your Y plus is, why you've chosen it and be ready to uh, defend it as well. And the way you change your Y plus is quite simple. You don't actually need to understand what the CFD code is doing. You can just reduce the thickness of those cells on the wall and just rerun your CFD simulation again. And the final points I spoke about in the last few minutes are 
that Y plus is not the only parameter which affects accuracy. There are other parts of the mesh which are important as well. And we're going to look at those in a bit more detail uh, in the workshop. If I, if I do this and bring this back. Um, so that's, that's the end of the slides. Um, and I've passed the slides over to Joseph as well. So of course, if there's any detail in there, you know, don't, don't worry if you didn't catch it at the time, you'll have access to the slides afterwards and you can always uh, go through those and look back on things um, if you want as well. Because I know there's quite a lot of detail in there and you might want to go back and make notes on some of the slides as well. Um, but uh, we definitely got, we got some time before the next talk. So if, if anyone has any questions, you know, please either um, either shout out on the mic or just put the questions in the chat. I'll maybe give you, give you a few minutes to type and then uh, maybe I'll go through some answers then. Sounds good, Aidan. Thank you so much. We have one question in the chat already. Did you see it? Mm. On the pipe yeah. flow. Yeah. Um, it turns out that if you're wanting to do experiments, if you think about the experimental setup, you can do experimental setups, which tend to be easy for people. You can either do a box, so you can have a box shaped channel, or you can do a pipe. And I'm not sure why they would choose necessarily choose a pipe over a box. And actually it turns out when you do the CFD that when you get very close to the wall, it doesn't really matter whether you've used a, a, a pipe or a box. Um, it's this, we're looking in the boundary layer, which is very close to the wall. Of course, away from the wall, the profile will be different in a, in a 3D channel as it will uh, compared to a pipe. And maybe this is the, the understanding point to think about as well in CFD, which is really the, the genius of everything, is that very close to the wall, the behavior of that viscous sublayer, the very thin layer close to the wall, is, is actually universal almost regardless of what type of flow you're looking at. And there are some changes that you get if you have a compressible flow. In a compressible flow, you get viscous heating as well. Um, so if you think of something like uh, the space shuttle, when the space shuttle is coming in for, for re-entry, the surface is really hot and the flow is moving really fast. And so there are some changes in the layer close to the wall when you have something that's sort of hypersonic and compressible. But for most everyday applications, if you're if you're not working for SpaceX, then you're probably fine and you don't need to worry about that. And actually the, the profile is pretty universal whether you use a pipe or a box. Um, I can't remember exactly the paper if you if you did want to go and look at the actual data. Um, I think it was a paper by Moser it was the original paper. Let me see. See if I can find it. Look at that, I've actually found it. Cool. Thanks so much, Aiden, for sharing. And we'll give it a couple more minutes, otherwise we can wrap it up and then you have a longer break for the next yeah. session. <laughs> and <laughs> that was can probably, relax a little bit. Yeah, it's quite a lot and it's quite a difficult topic. Um, Y plus, it definitely causes a lot of people confusion. Even, even CFD engineers who've been doing CFD for a long time don't really understand it. And often the, often the takeaway message that you'll hear if people just talking over the water cooler is uh, Y plus of one is best. <laughs> That's, and often people forget why it's just always, if your Y plus of one is, if your Y plus is one, then it's good. And actually often a way to get through reviews um, quite easily is if, if you're able to run a CFD analysis with a Y plus of one and you say, I made a really high quality mesh. My Y plus is one. 
here's a contour plot or a line plot to show it, then people will often just tick and sign it off because often they've forgotten why. <laughs> um, and it, it also, that's, that's a, an interesting one as well, because if you, if you're writing your own journal paper to submit or your own thesis and you've got a Y plus of two or three, you can sometimes be a bit worried because you think, oh, the, the reviewers may come back and say, why is it your Y plus one, even though they don't know why anymore. Um, so if you get a Y plus of one, often you can, you can sleep easy at night. No one's going to question you on that. But if your Y plus is a bit bigger, um, which is what I had, then you can do a comparative study like the one with the aerofoil, and that's usually enough to keep reviewers away. Excellent. Would you say that Y plus is the most, quote unquote, the most confusing part of CFD, especially when you started learning CFD? Yeah, I think it it was definitely one. It was definitely one of the hardest bits of CFD. That and the the pressure velocity coupling is the other thing that I found really, really difficult to understand. Um, and I'm going to be doing more on that this year, but just looking at the, at the Navier-Stokes equations and sort of trying to work out how the, how the pressure works in an incompressible solution. That was, that's taken me a long time to understand that and Y plus definitely two of the hardest bits for learning. Mm -hmm. All right. If there are no more questions, guys, we'll give uh, Aiden back some time to relax before the next session. Yeah. Otherwise, I mean, you'll delve deep in the next session anyway, so just to yeah. solidify the, the learnings. All right, cool. Hey, thanks, everyone. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, you said that uh, the Y plus uh, depends on the density and the viscosity, which yeah. will change near the wall. Mm -hmm. So how we can uh, choose our Y plus at the beginning of the simulation? Yeah. Um, so if you have uh, if you have a, a fairly normal flow scenario, so if you've got flow in a if you've got flow in a pipe um, and it's just air or just water, normal fluids, the the density and the viscosity don't vary throughout the domain, and so you can just take the standard values of density. And viscosity for air um, for your estimation but the the tricky bit comes in if you've got a flow where density does vary so if you've got a buoyancy driven flow or if you've got a flow that's multi-phase or multi-species um, where the density and the viscosity vary um, then you know it looks a bit more confusing and you think well what's what's the density and the dynamic viscosity going to be close to the wall and luckily for the y plus calculation the cfd code will do it for us so the cfd code will calculate the variation of density and dynamic viscosity everywhere and then in the cells close to the wall it will say the density in this cell is equal to this and its dynamic viscosity is equal to this i'll calculate y plus and then in the next cell it will say the density is this the dynamic viscosity is this and it will calculate it but of course that's still difficult for us because what do we do for that first estimation? And we think, well, what's, what's the first estimation going to be? And as it is only a first estimation, you can often the way I would do it is just take the value that you know. So if you, for example, if you have air and your air is at ambient temperature coming into your CFD domain and you've got some heated walls and you know that on the walls the temperature is going to go up the density is going to reduce but you you don't know the temperature and you don't know the density for that first estimation it's usually fine to just use the value of cold air that you have coming in because it is only as an initial estimate and the the air density may vary by five or ten percent you know throughout the domain but that initial estimate um the correlation is based on a Reynolds number. There's a Reynolds number correlation. So actually, even if your density or viscosity varies by five or 10%, the Reynolds number doesn't change by an order of magnitude. It only changes by five or 10%. So it has very little effect on the estimation. So just, just use the values you have. It's a, 
it's a first go. You're always going to have to change it again later. Cool. All right. And thank you so much. Um, so we'll wrap it up and see each other in 25 minutes, roughly. Yeah, 25 That's minutes. Good. All right. Then see you later. Cool. Thanks all. I'll see you in a bit. Bye-bye.